Uh, today's lesson is Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, before uh, talking about the Presbyterian Church in America, we have to say some uh, the other things. Uh, today, I want to say about the style of church buildings. Uh, what's this? Uh, biblical era, I believe that uh, there was no mega church like today. Uh, possibly all the churches, house churches, um, the Jerusalem church, they gather together at the house of Mark. And the Colossi, Colossian church also gathered in the house of, of Philemon. So we can find a lot of the churches, uh, what in your house. So I believe the biblical era, uh, there were only house church. No big church building, even no mega church. The small congregations, I believe this is very, very biblical concept. Uh, today, the church style is quite different from the beginning of the church. We have the very big building and a lot of people gather together. Uh, over 500 people or over 10,000 people. Some church, uh, thousand, thousand people. But it's quite different from the beginning of the church. So now, because of the COVID-19 coronavirus, we cannot gather together in church building for worship service. But now we are spread in the, each house. The family gather together, worship the Lord. I believe this is not wrong because we more closely follow the biblical eras, the church style. So we have to remember, uh, think about the apostolic church. Uh, second, the church style is catacomb. Catacomb means underground tomb. So because of persecution until AD 313, all the Christians, they went on the ground. Even they worshiped the Lord at catacomb, the tomb, underground tomb. Because Roman people, they discussed this place. They never visit this place. But the Christians, because of persecution, they gathered together uh, in the tomb. But the place, worship place, actually is not so important. House or tomb is no problem. The, the most important thing is the contents, contents of teaching. Teach, teaching the Bible is more important. So if any church has no sound doctrine, they are always mentioned about the size of building or number of church members. But we already discussed about the genuine characters of the church. The first, good doctrine. Second, the ownership. Third, the fighting against all the errors. If you, your church has this kind of character, I believe your church is a true and genuine church. But no sound of doctrine, no gospel of Jesus Christ, or anyone control the church, not Jesus, not by Jesus Christ, or they never want to fight against the errors. I believe this church is not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, and uh, you must serve biblical 
and genuine church. If you are, your church is not this kind of church, you must pray for your church's leadership and you must do something. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, after graduating Faison Bible College with a doctor degree, PhD degree, I went to one church, Korean church. Uh, actually, the pastor of that church was my teacher in Bible college in Korea. That time, he just graduated from Bob Jones University with a PhD degree. He was a very good man. I learned from him uh, contemporary theology. So I learned a lot of things from him, and I respect him. I loved him very much. And he... Uh, called me to serve Korean church. So I, I asked the Pastor Jeffrey Ku and Pastor Reverend Kwek, uh, can I go to my home country? Uh, they said, yes, you go. You have to do something for your own people. So I returned back to Korea. But I served that church one and a half years. And I recognize something because uh, 20 years ago, this church ch ch uh, has 500 church members for adults and 2,500 children in that church. But after 20 years, only 150 adults and only 20 children in the church. What happened to this church? So I want to have the, the answer. So I research everything in the church. So I recognized something. Uh, the children, they never have any knowledge of salvation. Even though they attend the church uh, from their birth to 20 years old, they never listen to gospel message at church. Very interesting. So every time I preach, I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving knowledge. Uh, my second question, why these children has no knowledge of salvation? So I search uh, their parents. Their parents also has no knowledge of salvation. So I preach every time when I preach to them. A Wednesday service, one Wednesday service after my preaching, of course I, I concluded my preaching with this word. Do you believe in Jesus? You must believe in Jesus. And after preaching, the pastor, he called me, to his office. So I visited him. He said, uh, Pastor Bach, uh, you cannot preach that kind of preaching. So I wonder, I shocked, Pastor, uh, every means of the gospel must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to save soul. I believe uh, in our church there are some people who still need the salvation knowledge. Then the pastor said to me, no, 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 no. This is unpol unpolite attitude because these people already knows every knowledge and they listen to my sermon 20 years. I believe they are all saved. So do not preach anymore the gospel of Jesus Christ. I shocked. I love that pastor, but I remember I became pastor to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that time I decided to resign. So I tell the pastor, pastor, I cannot serve this church. But I didn't say anything to him. But 
I said to him, I'll resign. Because if I cannot preach the gospel, why I have to hear? So I resigned that church. The Lord called me as a missionary to Africa. So now I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ freely. Remember, he, had, he has a very, very conservative knowledge, conservative theology. But his own righteousness is above than the righteousness of God. So he said, no need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you think this church is true church, genuine church? I don't believe that. Be careful. We have a sound doctrine. We learn good theology from Feist Bible College. Nevertheless, don't forget the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to preach continually without ceasing the gospel message to our people. Uh, my two daughters, um, they were born in Christian family. Uh, they diligently attend the, all the worship service. Nevertheless, my first daughter, Angela, she was born again, um, 12 years old. And uh, Joyce, the second one, the younger daughter, uh, she was born again, um, 14 years old, 15 years old. Uh, the second are always, always some difficult. I don't know why. Uh, nevertheless, by the grace of the Lord, finally they believed in Jesus Christ. Their, fa their grandfather is pastor. Uh, their father also pastor. But they were not believing in Jesus Christ automatically. I preached the gospel to them and I tried to give them saving knowledge. And finally, I sent them to Firestone Bible College. Nothing else, not for a degree. I asked them, go and learn the word of God. By the grace of the Lord, uh, Joyce, uh, younger daughter, she believed in Jesus Christ through the teaching of the Firestone Bible College. Why? Firestone Bible College not just teaching the student uh, the theological knowledge, but teaching the Bible directly. There's a factual she believed in Jesus Christ. Remember, the no gospel, no Jesus, this is not church. Even though they had the big church buildings and big numbers of church uh, congregations, nevertheless, this is not the church. So remember, the fundamental doctrine of the church we have to remember one man in Roman uh, history, the Constantine, the Great. He issued the Edict of Milan in 313, which proclaimed tolerance of all religion throughout the empire. It means uh, he did not make the Christianity a as a Roman official religion. He just proclaimed tolerance of all religions. Before uh, Christianity, there are some religions in Rome, they allowed several religions, but they didn't allow the Christianity. But now, AD 313, by Constantinus I, he uh, proclaim tolerance of all religions. So Christians can have the freedom to worship the Lord. No persecutions. 
After uh, this man, Theodosius I, Theodosius the Great, issued decrees that effectively made Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. From this time, uh, if you want to be uh, to serve uh, serve the nation as uh, some office as a minister, you must be a uh, Christian. If you are not Christian, you cannot have any official job in nation. So every man want to be a uh, Christian, even though. They are not believing in Jesus Christ truly. This is the starting point of the church collapse, uh, apostate church. So, the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Empire join together. After the church building style changed, we call this style is the Basilica. A basilica originally used to describe a Roman public buildings, also applied to building used for religious purpose. Very big, and all the Christians gather together in basilica. A state of religion, no wonder. After this, uh, church has uh, another style of church buildings. Romanesque. This is related with the Holy Roman Empire by uh, Carlos Magnus from the 6th to the 10th century. Many castles were built during this period. And B Cathedral also were built. Now the church uh, lost uh, the truth, and they replace the truth of the Bible uh, with the big building and rituals. So, Carlos Magnus, as known as Charlemagne or Charles the Great or Karl der Grobe, king of the Frank from 768 and emperor of the Romans, from 800 to his death in 814. Uh, Carlos Magnus, Charles the Great, Charlemagne, or Karl der Grobe. Uh, he is the one of the uh, king who support Roman Catholics. The last style of the church, uh, medieval church, is uh, Gothic. Uh, Gothic means the style of God. God means one tribe of German. The expression of mentality uh, is very famous with pinnacle. Uh, you, we have to know with uh, this style of church building. Uh, this kind of church building has uh, some idea. You know, the Gothic uh, looks like a triangle. Pinnacle. The vertex of the triangle, it means God or salvation, etc. Two sides of a triangle, this is two way or to the vertex. Uh, we can have the two kind of uh, revelation reach to God. One is the special revelation. One is the natural level revelation. What is special revelation? It's the Bible. And what is natural revelation? It is the reason. Okay? So they believe we can reach to God two way. Okay? Of course, we can find God in the Bible. But the other way is we can use our reason. We can Find also God, they said. How about the salvation? Of course, two ways. One is the by grace. Another is by works. So what is the 
salvation by Roman Catholic Church. Grace plus works together we call salvation. Uh, Roman Catholic Church never deny the grace. They also said we need the grace of the Lord to be saved. But in addition, very, very little good works. Little merit. And you can have the salvation. Is this true? No. So, we are saying five solas. Last time we already mentioned about the five solas. By faith alone. No works. By grace alone. No works. Right? The five solas. Sola scriptura. We can find, we can see God only by the scripture alone. Not by reason. Because our reason already affected by sin. So our reason is not working correctly. So something good is there, but our reason cannot recognize 100% already affected by the sin. This is the problem. So we can have only the special revelation for salvation. So the Bible is enough, sal enough revelation for our salvation. So the reformers, they said, sola scriptura, by scripture alone. We don't need any revelation more. The Bible is enough for our salvation. Sola fide, by faith alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Solus Christus, solo Christo, through Christ alone. Soli deo gloria, glory to God alone. So memorize uh, five solas. Uh, one more. I want to say to you, uh, someone said uh, Reformation was started from 1517 by uh, Martin Luther. Before Reformation, there was no true church, no genuine church. Only the first church, Roman Catholic Church was. But I believe this concept is something wrong. The true church, genuine church, always exists through the history. So where is the church? Genuine church, true church. This is must be a question. The Roman Catholic Church, they tried to uh, destroy, demolish all the record of genuine church. The medieval age, especially. So let's uh, see the graph. Uh, of course, first time we have the apostolic church. Uh, this church starts from Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 to 18. Jesus Christ said, upon this rock I will build my own, my church. And after this, uh, was, this word was established, fulfilled in Act, Acts of Apostles chapter 2. The day of Pentecost, a church was established. Jerusalem church. After Jerusalem church, um, they dispersed uh, around the world by persecution. The Lord used the, na the, the Apostle Paul before Apostle Paul, his name was Saul. He persecuted the church and church dispersed around the world. And they uh, established a church around the world, even the Antioch church, 
Apostle Church and also the Church of Rome. Even, I believe, uh, the Apostle Paul, he evangelized to Spain also. So, at the most part of the world, they went and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this genuine church never disappeared. So they had uh, the gospel light, always. So, someone said, before 1517, there was only false church. The genuine church comes out from this church. This concept is totally wrong. Okay? So, the, as a historian, I'm very sorry because, um, I'm always teaching my student for medieval church history. It's not the genuine church history. I'm always taught, was teaching them the Roman Catholic church history. I'm very sorry. But there is no some no sources about the genuine history. But now I get some information about the genuine church history. So next time if God allows me to teach you, I'll teach you the genuine church history from apostolic church and also medieval Genuine church history, not Roman Catholic church history. Okay? From this genuine church history, true church revived. We call this Reformation. Of course, before Martin Luther, we can find some good theologians, uh, pre-reformers like uh, Jan Hus in Bohemia, and John Wycliffe in England. My question is, John Hus and John Wycliffe, where they can get this kind of good knowledge? A very interesting question, isn't it? So, let's see on our uh, next uh, chart, succession of the church, apostolic church, through genuine church until today. But after AD 313, uh, from the day of Constantine, the first church, they were, first church, first church was exist. This, we, now today we call this first church, uh, Roman Catholic church or some heretical church. So true church is always exist. Remember this, apostolic church and true and genuine church until today. We have the same doctrine, we have the same concept of the church, of the theology with apostolic church. Apostolic church is none than to keep same truth with us in the Bible of the Bible. We are the descendant of the apostolic church, true and genuine church. So of course, some uh, church member, they can fall into false churches. Also, false church members can repent and return back to churches. But nevertheless, always genuine and true church never fail, never fall, always exist. Remember this. This is a very, very important concept. So, I say unto you, we are not come out from Roman Catholic Church. We just succeed the genuine and true church tradition. We come out from apostolic church. We never, never have any relationship with Roman Catholic Church. Remember this. 
So now let's turn to our view to American Presbyterian Church. Of course, this apostolic traditions to the reformers, especially John Calvin. Calvin uh, had passed over passed, uh, the truth to John Knox. John Knox, he reformed the Scotland with the Presbyterian policy, Presbyterian Church. And Presbyterian Church in Scotland, uh, they established uh, American Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Church in America was not self-generation. It means they also had their forefathers in faith. Europeans who had immigrated to America did important roles for the formation of the Presbyterian Church in America. Generally, in the first congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America were consisted with Scottish Presbyterian and Scottish Irish Presbyterians. So the, the Presbyterians in American Presbyterian Church, the church member, they came from Scotland and Northern Ireland. Another group, those who hold on the pietistic, pietistic tradition, uh, the, the, these men came from England. We call them Puritans. But these Puritans are not, were not the Presbyterian church members. Uh, usually they were, con came from congregational churches. So different from us. So the former, uh, the Scottish Presbyterian as Scottish Irish Presbyterians holding on Calvinistic tradition. They were the descendants of John Knox and his successors. So they had a reformed theology. They had a strong doctrine on the Bible, strong doctrine on the salvation. But the the later party, the, those who hold on the pietistic tradition, the Puritans, uh, they came from England. They placed at New England. But uh, relatively, the Puritans, they had very lesser, uh, emphasize on the Bible. Rather, they emphasize to their doing the holy life. So they pray very hard. The relatively they uh, has the low view of the Bible. Uh, let's see the why the Northern Ireland they can have the um, this Presbyterian. Uh, systems. Okay, we have to remember one man, Oliver Cromwell. The English uh, military and political leader born in the middle gentry, he was a Puritan, a member of the long parliament. Uh, during the English Civil War, he was the side of the parliament, parliamentarians. So he uh, was called Lord and Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland. A Cromwell's force defeated the Confederate and Loyalist coalition in Ireland and occupied the country. We uh, say this Irish Confederate was. 1641-1653. When James I uh, ascended the English throne, he decided to colonize Northern Ireland with Protestants. 
Most of the Protestants were Scottish Presbyterians, and they came to form the bulk of the population in Northern Ireland. So the other part of Ireland were Roman Catholic. Only Northern Ireland is Presbyterian. Until today, these Scottish Irish Presbyterians were the ancestors of those now living in Northern Ireland. Okay? When England placed economic disabilities upon them before AD 1700, about 20, uh, 2,000, 200,000 migrated to North America. They had all the Presbyterian faith. They were Presbyterians. The Presbyterian churches in America in which the congregation called themselves Presbyterians were established at Long Island in the state of New York in 16 40s and 1650s. They called themselves, we are Presbyterians. As 1680s, Scottish Irish immigra immigrants asked the Presbyterian well, Lagan sending pastor to Maryland and Virginia. Uh, of course, that time in America, there was no Bible college and no system of Presbyterian church. So they ask to Presbyterian Lagan send pastors to Maryland and Virginia. So the 1683, the Presbyterian Lagan sent Reverend Francis McKamey, who has called the father of American Presbyterian church. So, at 1706, Reverend Francis McKamey led establishing the first presbytery of Philadelphia. And after 10 years, 1716, uh, since the first presbytery, the synod was established. Okay, every church has a BOE, Board of Elders, right? The board of, El board of elders, they send the represent, representative to the presbytery. And presbytery also send the representative to uh, synod. So now, uh, it means there are several churches. They had the BOE and they had the presbytery. Now they had the synod. Later, it, will be developed into general assembly. But uh, say before this, we have to talk about enlightenment first, because that time the America has no Bible college, and where they can have their pastor from. It's the very important issue that time. How can they bring their own pastor? No Bible college. So they import all the pastors from Europe, especially from England. But the time England has uh, some crisis in faith because of the Enlightenment. What is enlightenment? It's from German word Aufklärung. In the Western philosophical tradition, enlightenment is seen as a phase in cultural history marked by philosophical methodologies which employ knowledge and reason generally accompanied by the rejection of faith in Christianity. I already told you the idea of Gothic style. Uh, this is a triangle and like a pinnacle and vertex, the point. 
is the salvation of all, not all this is a revelation, right? But that time, the Roman Catholic Church allowed two ways to reach uh, God. Two ways of revelation. One is the special revelation, the Bible, God's Word. But they allow, allowed another way of revelation. What's that? It's the reason. Okay? So this time, uh, through the enlightenment, they forsake Pursuit the special revelation. So they said, oh, in the Bible, we can see not a scientific record, not reasonable record. But now we are modernized people. We have to use our own vision. So, new way to know God. This is the reason, not the Bible. So, now we are not believing all the record in the Bible. Of course, we accept some part of the Bible, not all. So, think, use your reason. So, they reject all the fundamental doctrine of Christianity. We call this enlightenment. Enlightenment means uh, all the people, they are in darkness because they came out from the dark age, middle age. Okay? So we have to give them the light. But this light, it's not the gospel light. This light comes from reason, reasoning. In secular use, the concept refers mainly to the European intellectual movement known as the Age of Enlightenment, also called the Age of Reason. Referring to philosophical developments related to scientific rationality in the 17th and 18th century. So, influence of enlightenment. Uh, first, the German rationalism. So now, until today, German uh, of pact Effected by enlightenment. So, of course, in German, uh, they had a good knowledge about the Bible. So, in German, in Germany, uh, the high school students, they are learning Greek, you know. So, they had a very fluent Greek knowledge. Better than us. We are just study Greek on the Mrs. To only in the Bible College of East, uh, sorry, Faison Bible College. But the uh, German, they are learning Greek from high school. So they can study Greek text, original text, but they are using their knowledge wrong way. They always make uh, and using the corrupted text, Nestle Alland. Now they publish 28th edition. The German rationalism. Uh, one of, I know one man, he studied in Germany, the theology. He sent the message, uh, oh, this place like a den of Satan. And I said, why are you studying in the den of the Satan? Just come out and learn good things. Study the Bible. Do not study the theology. They are not teaching them. They are not teaching the German theologians 
very a few are conservative, the others or liberals. Even they are not believing in Jesus Christ. I told several times the daughter of Reverend Makim, the principal of Bible College of East Africa. Uh, now she is uh, struggling to write her thesis, uh, dissertation, um, because her professor, uh, supervisor, advisor is a uh, atheist. Do you know who is atheist? He is the degree or PhD in New Testament. He is theologian, but he is not believing, believing in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine this? This is all the influence of enlightenment, the rationalism. They are not believing in the Bible anymore. Also, it uh, influenced to France, French naturalism. What is naturalism? The naturalism means um, the nature is a goddess. Okay, so it is very good to protect the nature. But if you have uh, this kind of concept, the naturalism is uh, another religion. So be careful. We protect our mountains and river and this, this earth. Nevertheless, it cannot be a goddess. Okay. So third, the English deism. What is deism? Uh, deism is, comes from Latin word Deus. Deus means God. This is another theology, but quite different from our theism. Theism is knowledge of God, right? Knowledge on God. But this is not biblical theism. This is a new theism. The new theology of God. But this God is not God in the Bible. Okay? We call this English theism. So influence of enlightenment, German rationalism and French naturalism, English theism. All together we call this primitive, prim primitive liberalism. It means, uh, from this three liberalism now, the liberalism was developed and now they had another uh, concept, well developed concept. Okay? The rationalism is any view applying to reason as a source of knowledge of justification. So no knowledge, no reason is nothing. The reason is another God. We call this modernism. Okay, they emphasize reasoning. But now the we call today is not just modern. This is a postmodern era, right? So the modernism, they say we can find the truth through the reason. But postmodernism denied this concept. Postmodernism said, oh, modern day, they try to find the truth the, with reasoning. But nowadays we know there is no truth. So, where is the truth? Nobody knows. So we cannot say there is truth. So everyone, if you want to say anything, you can say this is the postmodernism. So now the postmodernists, they deny the reason also. They lost everything. So I believe we have to return back to the Bible. Why? Bible teaches us the truth. 
So this postmodern days, we emphasize the old way, old paths. We have to go via Antiqua. The Bible never changed from the beginning until today. It brings us the salvation knowledge. Except the Bible, except Jesus Christ, no salvation, no truth, no knowledge. So, they learn, the peoples outside of the church, outside of the Bible, they learn more and more, more and more, but they are more foolish because they far, far from away the truth, the Bible. That's the reason why so many leaders, so many people make mistakes today because no truth in them. So learn the truth from the Bible. How can you say there's no truth in this world? Because they lost the truth from the Bible. Okay? The naturalism any of several philosophical sentences wherein all phenomena commonly labeled as supernatural are either false or not inherently different from natural phenomena. So naturalism, they never uh, allow the supernatural things, the miracles in the Bible. Okay. The methodological naturalism, science is to be done with a reference to supernatural cause. Uh, metaphysical naturalism, the cosmos consists only of objects studied by the natural science. Spiritual naturalism, an approach to spirituality that is devoid of supernaturalism. Of course, we agree with uh, science because all scientific law is established by God himself. We agree. Well, we call this scientific. We never deny science, science right? So now you are learning on the Dr. Jose Lagapa Biblical Science. Why we are learning the science? If we understand science correctly, we have to know the Bible. Because, because of sin, the subject to, subject who recognize the object are uh, infected by sin. We are not perfect. Same time, the object, the nature, scientific nature also influenced by sin. So this natural condition is not perfect conditions. They also influenced by sin. They must be re Prepared and recovered by the power of God. So we have to adjust the subject and adjust also the object of science. Okay? So we need biblical knowledge to interpret this nature, interpret the human being. So we are learning biblical science. Am I right? So, we agree with the scientific factor, but we are not agree with the scientism. What is scientism? It means they make the science as a god. Okay? But the biblical truth always has the highest authority over the science. We know only one part of science, not every or everything. Only God knows everything of the 
creature because he is the the creator of this universe, heavens and the earth. So we humbly asking to the Lord to understand the science. If you have any question, don't bring to me the question. Bring to Dr. Jose Lagapa. He is teaching you very well about this. Okay, the English deism. Deism was derived from Latin word deus. The belief that at least one deity exists can create the world, but that the creator does not alter the original plan for the universe. The clockwork universe theory in which a God designs and builds the universe but steps aside to let it run on its own. We call this natural law. Is it true? Uh, if you have this work, uh, clockwork universe theory, you cannot believe uh, any miracle in the Bible. And you cannot pray unto the Lord because He retired. He doesn't want to do anything for His own people. You just follow the natural law. Is this biblical concept? Is this the God in the Bible? No, I don't believe that. Our God is still alive. He is working for us. He never sleep. He is listen to our prayer. He is always be with us. Jesus Christ, He sent His disciple to the world. Go ye therefore and make disciples all the nations. And he said, I am with you always. Right? He promised us he is with us always. Even today, even this time, he is walking for his kingdom, for his people. So we cannot allow this kind of theory, deism. Deism became more prominent in the 17th and 18th centuries during the age of reason, especially in Britain, France, and Germany, and America. Among intellectuals raised at Christians who found they could not believe in supernatural miracles, the inerrancy of the scripture or the trinity, but who did believe in one God. I, they forsake, forsook uh, the Bible. They lost all the truth in the Bible because they focus on the reason. They despise the Bible because Bible has a lot of supernatural miracles. But this is not reasonable. How can Jesus Christ walk on the surface of the water? It's not, we cannot understand. So how can we, he raise up the dead man from death? From death. And how can he heal the, from all the sickness? We need the doctor, right? We need the boat. So it's not reasonable. It's not scientific. So we cannot believe in the Bible. Bible is the word of God. This is a uh, Unbelievable, okay? So they deny all the fundamental doctrines. 
They do not believe the inerrance of the scripture. Why we believe in that the Bible is God's word? Bible is inspired by God, but they do not believe God is working, right? God is retired after his creation. He never do anything. So he cannot inspire the Bible. So Bible is not God's word. It's a just a human product. It contains a lot of errors and contains myth, contains false. So they didn't believe the inerrance of scripture. Also, they are not believing the Trinity. It's not reasonable. God is one God, but three person? How can we harmonize one and three are equal? It's not reasonable. So they do not believe the Trinity. So they believe only if God exists, he must be only one God. We call this Unitarians. And another name is today, Jehovah's Witness. We are the witness of Jesus Christ. We believe in Trinity. But they do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is not God. So we must be only one God. We must be a witness of Jehovah. So they call themselves Jehovah's Witness. Modern days. Unitarians. Okay? From this, uh, there is the God is dead theology came out. What is God is dead theology? They said, uh, God created this world and He retired. He did not anything. It means, Okay, he is exists, but do nothing. It means for us, it is same. He is dead. So God is dead. Theology come out from this theism. So they said, "Oh, God is not working today. So we have to overcome every difficulties by ourselves." So we need the superhero. Of course, someday superhero will come to us in the name of Antichrist. Pietism. A pietism is very, uh, we have to very care about the pietism. Outwardly, pietism has no problem because they focus on very good life. They are praying, uh, but remember, the pietism is a sister of liberalism. It was influenced by the Enlightenment. Actually, the University of Halle in Germany was the University of Pietism. But the first liberal university was the Halle University. Why? Because uh, the one is denied the Bible, but one. The pietism, they never concern the Bible because they always focus on their life. Common and significant future between liberalism and pietism is that they deny that the Bible is not the foundation of faith. The liberalism, they say, liberalists, they said, uh, the foundation of faith is risen, not the Bible. And the pietism said the foundation of the faith is not the Bible, but the religious 
um, experience. Okay? But uh, our uh, position is quite different from Pietism. The Westminster Shorter Catechism number two. What rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? Answer. The Word of God which is contained in the scripture of the Old and New Testament is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. Remember the Westminster Shorter Catechism number 2. This is very, very important. The number 1 is uh, related with uh, our purpose of life. Why we have to live in this earth for? Why? What for? Not for ourselves, only for the glory of God. Solely their glory. Some Christians said if they want, if they have anything they want, this is successful life, blessed life. But the purpose of the, our faithful life is not to have comfortability in this world. To serve the Lord, to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. If you have anything you want, this life is not really blessed life. Are you glorifying God? Question to you. And second question, what rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? Answer, the scripture of the Old and New Testament. This is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. So don't forget. Until today, we are fighting for these second questions, the word of God. The Satan always tried to destroy the authority of the Bible. Today, they deny the verbal plenary preservation. No verbal plenary preservation, inspiration is useless. No inspiration, the Bible has no power because this is not God's word anymore. Very dangerous doctrines. So we keep the very precious doctrine, verbal plenary inspiration. Also, bubble plenary preservation. This is the how to depend the authority of the Bible. Very important. So, Bible is the only and supreme and final authority for Christians. Not reason. And not our holy life, not our experience. No? The piety, today's pietism is, uh, I think, is a um, charismatic movement. The charismatic, they never concern about uh, what, about, concern what Bible says. Okay? They always focus on their own experience. I am speaking tongue. One day, one church, church member, he came to Korean worship service. Of course, if he get the membership, he must do 12 weeks educations. So I, I knew he came from charismatic church. So first class, what is the error of charismatism? Nowadays, if today I'm teaching her, maybe I'll teach her the 12th class. 
last class, the era of charismatism. But that time I, I never compromised. So first time we have to decide whether still accept the charismatic or deny the charismatics. Eh? So I taught her all the errors of charismatics. So, but first time she was shocked. Why? Because she believed she was speaking tongue. Eh? She believed the tongue speaking comes from the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of Holy Spirit. Eh? So she, she is speaking tongue means she has the Holy Spirit. Eh? And she has the Holy Spirit. This is the evidence of her salvation. So she said, I believe I am saved because I can speak tongue. So I said to her, I believe the speaking tongue is not the gift from the Holy Spirit. What is the speaking tongue now? She said, nothing. And she was crying. She believed she was a believer because speaking tongue. So I told her, the Bible never say if anyone speaking tongue, he is saved. No, never. The Bible said, believe in Jesus Christ and you are saved. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? But she never think about Jesus Christ. And she returned home, and during three months, she was fighting with the brother-in-law. Because brother-in-law, he knew the Bible very well. And after three months, the brother-in-law, he came to me, pastor, forgive me. My mother-in-law, never give up her charismatic uh, attitude. So we were fighting each other during three months, every night. So now, almost we, my wife and I, almost, not 100%, almost divide. It means the devotion. So what can I do? I said to him, it's your choice. You decide. And after a few days, uh, he called me, Pastor, sorry, we have to leave this church. I have to survive with my mother-in-law. Speaking tongue, someone says, speaking tongue is just personal experience. There's no problem personally speaking tongue in the church, but that time I realized it's related with our salvation knowledge. Very, very serious and fundamental problem. Speaking tongue never bring us the salvation. Believing in Jesus Christ bring us the salvation. Am I right? So the, this kind of experience cannot be a, our authority. So this is against the Bible, God's truth. We must forsake all our experience. I was speaking tongue, but I believe in Jesus Christ, and I knew this was useless. So I forsook this charismatic attitude, throw away. It's nothing. So today, I hate Charismatic very much. 
I strongly against charismatic because once upon a time I was a charismatic. Now I knew all the errors. My pastor, he was a great power, even casting demons. And he healed some peoples. But I know, I, today I remember that time. Is it true? He really healed all people? And he really casted the demons? I'm not sure. But that time I was, I had a blind faith. Okay? So I couldn't see anything. But the gospel light grant me the light of truth. And now I can see the truth. So be careful. Our faith cannot build upon our experience. Okay? Our faith must be established upon this luck. What is this luck? Sound doctrine, confession of faith. Remember this. So remember the danger in pietism. Personal behavior without the word of God. This is the American Puritans. They also have the devotional times with prayers, but they despise the word of God. This is American Puritans. Prayer without the word of God. This is charismatics today. So be careful. So they never uh, study the Bible. Of course, they sometimes they are quoting some verses of the Bible without context. I already told you this is demonic uh, interpretation of the Bible. They need the help of the Holy Spirit. We call this illuminations. But they never think about this. They interpret all the Bible through their own experience. Of course, we can have some special experience like uh, the Apostle Paul. He saw Jesus Christ and also like John Song. But nevertheless, we cannot make this the foundation of our faith. This is a personal experience. How can we take the place of the Bible? The Bible is the, our final and supreme, only one authority. Our faith and life, remember this. Okay, in 1792, uh, because of this kind of wrong doctrine, theology, deism, uh, the American Bible, American Presbyterian Church, they made one law. We call this Adopting Act 1722. Since 1706, the year of the first presbytery until 1729, the American Presbyterian Church did not have any official standards of the faith. At the time, the Presbyterian Church in England and America were facing up to intellectual challenges from enlightenment, especially deism. To protect the church, the Presbyterian Church in England asked all the Presbyterian pastors to subscribe their name to the Westminster Confession of Faith by which they would express their faith. Uh, here the England means New England, okay? Because there was no Bible college or seminary training Presbyterian pastors at the time in America, the American Presbyterian Church was adopting the English Presbyterian pastors. 
The presbytery of the new castle asked the synod to require all the new adopted pastors to subscribe their names to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So if you want to be a pastor of the church in America, you must sign up for Westminster Confession of Faith. Do you believe? Then you can be our pastor. You do, you do not agree with the Westminster Confession of Faith, you cannot be our pastor. Please sign. Generally, the conservative Scottish Irish Presbyterian agreed to subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay? Because they already agreed. They believed Westminster Confession of Faith and Shorter Catechism and Larger Catechism. No problem. Okay? I resign. The Presbyterian in New England who were relatively more tolerable than the conservative Scottish Irish Presbyterians, they refused to subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. I don't know why. They do not want to sign. Why? Because they had uh, some doubting, okay? All the doctrine in Westminster Confession of Faith. But the American Presbyterian Church, they compromised. As a result by mutual agreement, September 19, 1729, the Synod ratified the Adopting Act. What is Adopting Act? Of said confession, either by subscribing the said confession of faith and catechisms, or by a verbal declaration of their assent, the Thereto, as such means of candidate shall think best. It means if you don't want to subscribe, then you can declare your faith to Westminster Confession of Faith and large and shorter catechism with the words. Okay? Do you believe in? Yes, I do. That's all. Okay? Which is the better? The subscription. Okay? It's more strict. It's like a uh, treatment, okay? Like a uh, contract, okay? If you destroy, if you teaching anything else uh, with the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, you broke uh, your contract, your oath. So you must be resigned, okay? But the bubble decoration is uh, some loose form. So it will make some problem in the history of American Presbyterian Church. Okay, so first time, uh, we cannot have any compromise. Actually, the pastors, candidate of the ministers, they do not agree with the Westminster Confession of Faith. They have to go the other denomination, Episcopal Church or Congregational Church, even Roman Catholic Church, Anglican Church, wherever they want to go. But the Presbyterian Church, they must accept the Confession of Faith and Westminster Shorter Catechism, Raja Catechism as their fa the standards of faith. This is reasonable, right? But here, the Synod, they compromise. Okay? So, okay, if you say you believe, okay, we we'll believe, okay? So you can be our pastor. But majority of the bubble declaration parties Later, they left from the confession of faith. Verse means the confession of faith and larger and shorter catechisms. They denied later all the fundamental doctrine of the Bible and they support, supported the liberals. 
during the controversy of fundamentalism. Okay?